Pray with me. Lord, we're here for you this morning. For no other reason, we're here for you. Come, Holy Spirit, and speak to your people. Speak to your church. Open the ears of our hearts, O God, that we might hear your voice clearly, and then, and then give us, give us the courage to do exactly what you're calling us to do. Nothing more and nothing less. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Good morning. Welcome back to our continued series in the book of Corinthians, or rather even more specifically, studying intentionally Paul's letters to the church in the city of Corinth. I'm Wayne Neller. I serve as the overseer of C3 Church. For those of you that are new and don't know me, um, that gives you a little bit of an introduction. It's good to be back among you for a brief visit. About nine months ago, something began to happen to me that doctors foretold would happen decades ago, and that is all the nerves associated with my hearing started to die. And so that's a rapid process that uh, they said would occur, and albeit happening decades later, it is in fact happening. So if you want to talk to me after service, I'd love to talk with you, and I'll know what you're saying if you look at me, and, uh, and so I can see your face and more specifically your lips. Otherwise, I'm not going to have a clue, which will operate in your favor. For instance, you might be one of these people here this morning that has this deep, dark secret that you just have to share with somebody, but you're afraid to because you're afraid they might tell somebody else. Problem solved. Come up to me, put your hand in front of your mouth, and tell me as loud as you want your secret. It's a win-win. Right? I'll never have a clue what you said. So, seven months ago after... after going through the school of theology after ordaining him, uh, after mentoring him for four years, I appointed Gene Simcoe as the lead pastor of C3 Church. And in 30 years of ministry, I believe that that's one of my better decisions. Would you agree with me? Part of Gene's work Recently, most recently, has been the authoring of the book that I hope you've picked up by now. It is specific. Actually, I guess that's the, uh, that's the, the cover of that book. And if you get that, and I'm sure it's still being sold out in the lobby or whatnot, though I didn't ask first, but I'm sure it can be purchased here um, or given to you if you don't have the money. We want to get the word out. And this book is an amazing resource. And I believe that if you go through the book, I've read it, uh, if you go through this book, that it will immeasurably help you to get everything you can get out of this series that uh, we're doing in this, in Paul's letters. So please, please do that. Um, as a foundational question, undergirding everything that we do in this series is really the question, are we any different than these crazy Corinthians that we're reading about. I mean, we read about what they're doing, and are we really any different? We're going to be asking that question sometimes forthrightly, and sometimes it will be implied throughout this entire series. So, case in point, last week Gene mentioned how the Corinthians would determine how good a message was or how accurate a message was based upon the eloquence of the speaker. So the more eloquent, the more $5 words that the, the speaker would use, they would automatically assume that the message was more and more correct or better. Are we any different today? We tend to gauge people based on their appearance, even today. If I were standing before you and I were wearing a $700 suit, I had various jewelry on, maybe a Rolex watch. You might anticipate just by looking at me that the message you were about to receive was going to be here. We tend to judge still by appearance. 
And what Paul wants to make clear in these letters is the rules have changed. The rules have changed because of Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God, which we invited intentionally to come and open hearts and ears this morning that we can hear what he has to say. So, by way of getting into our message this morning, the text this morning, realize, I'm sure Gene has told you, that we are the ones that inserted chapters into these letters. They were letters. They weren't separated by verses or chapters. And so sometimes we have to reach back into what we consider a different chapter to appropriately understand the chapter we're currently studying. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, for instance, this morning, but we have to start in chapter 2. We have to start in chapter 2. And there are seven words that are used at the end of chapter 2, seven words that must be entertained if we really are going to understand chapter 3 and what Paul is talking about. Those seven words are, but we have the mind of Christ. But we have the mind of Christ. And therein lies the problem. It really does. Paul lovingly calls out the church. And that's my plan to do this morning and then head out of town before you tar and feather me. <laughs> but, but he lovingly calls out the church. I'm going to do the same because, you know, you and I are different than others. We're, we're, we, the way we think is different. It's as though God has reached in by His Spirit and supernaturally rewired our brain. We're different than others. God has set us apart as special. It's as though when we accepted Jesus Christ and allowed Holy Spirit to begin to work in our lives, He changed our DNA. Consider the ramifications of that as we look at our text this morning. But even before we get there, I love flippage. And uh, I've flipped for, for 30 years. I continue to flip. I'll take you here and there. And I know Gene does the same because I watch him a lot. And um, so, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you... Peter says, of the people of God, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So there's been a radical shift. The King James Version says, you and I, we're peculiar. We're peculiar people. And there's a sense in which if you put a, an unbeliever next to a believer, we should appear peculiar. What is important to us is different. What we talk about is different. The way we make our plans is different. The way we view life, death, marriage, Relationships is different now because of Jesus Christ, because of Holy Spirit who resides within us. What does Paul say? We have the mind of Christ. That's you. If you've accepted, if you're here this morning and you're one of the people like me who came to the point in your life when you said, you know what, this isn't working for me anymore. I try. I really try, but I'm just not the way I want to be. And, and I've driven my car and it's, it's in the ditch. The car of my life, it's in the ditch. What do I do? And when you look at Jesus Christ and you accept him, he gets your car back on the road. And there's a change that occurs. Some of that change is instantaneous. Other parts of it take a lifetime of working out. 
but we have the mind of Christ. So two questions I want to ask and answer this morning. Two questions. The first one is this. If we have the mind of Christ, why don't we use it? Why don't we use it? Now, the first thing that comes to mind, my mind, is maybe it's lack of understanding. Dr. Phil made it famous, but therapists like me and others have used it for years. We get to a place in talking to somebody, and we have the opportunity to say, what are you thinking? Right? I say that to myself sometimes. Maybe it's age. But, but sometimes I do the most stupid thing, and, and I find myself saying out loud, what are you thinking, Wayne? You know better than that. Sometimes when I think about not using the mind of Christ, it is because we don't understand. Check out Jude, verse 11. These people blaspheme anything they don't understand. What they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals, they destroy themselves with these things. Like unreasoning animals, they're not using. Sometimes people have that mind of Christ, but they don't want to, they're not using it. I think of the movie character Forrest Gump. How many of you remember Forrest? Okay, so, so quite a few. I don't necessarily recommend the movie, uh, because there's a lot of stuff in there that's not so good. But Forrest is a great character. Now, if you know anything about Forrest Gump, you know that his IQ was just slightly over 80, and so he took things very literally and, uh, and all of that. But on New Year's Eve, he and Lieutenant Dan, his close friend, were sitting together, and, and Lieutenant Dan, who had no educational limitation, presumably, looks at Forrest and he says, um, Gump, have you found Jesus yet? Well, Forrest looked at him and goes, I didn't know I was supposed to be looking for him, Lieutenant Dan. Sometimes it's lack of understanding. And churches are filled with people good people, well-intentioned people, and they don't understand that they can use the mind of Christ. It's available, just like Gene's resource book that you could use for the study. We have the mind of Christ. Problem is, some people don't want to use it. They know they have it, but they don't want to use it. They're comfortable the way they are. Check out Romans 128. And because they did not think it worthwhile to acknowledge God, God delivered them over to a worthless mind to do what is morally wrong. You see, if we don't use the mind of Christ, God says, okay. Have it your way. And you and I try our best to figure out what we're supposed to do, but we're not plugged into the source. If I do this to you, what do you think of? Peace, right? Peace. But in reality, if you keep going up, it's like an extension cord plugged into the source, which is Holy Spirit. Like an electric cord, if you get too far away from the source, what happens to the cord? It gets unplugged and you're left with your own devices. We need to stay plugged into the source, Jesus Christ, for the mind of Christ. Another option, if you don't want to use the mind of Christ, there is another option. Maybe you're just deceived. I like to remind people in therapy, the only thing worse than being deceived by someone else is being self-deceived. Being self-deceived. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. No one should deceive himself. If anyone, if anyone among you thinks he is wise in this age, he must become foolish so that he can become wise. 
I don't know about you, but I've encountered a lot of puffed up people, people that think they know a whole lot. Typically, they're the ones in churches who will fire off a round of verses that they've memorized that suit them, and they have no idea of the context of those verses, the cultural things going around those verses, but they fire off the words anyway, and it makes them sound good until you're one of those that knows what's really being said in that verse. Correctly dividing or understanding the word of truth. They make me think of velvet worms. Now, how many of you have heard of velvet, velvet worms? Oh, that's not good. Let me tell you about velvet worms. Velvet worms appear like cute, cuddly creatures. Their skin is like, well, velvet. And so they're, they're so cute, they have little stubby legs, and it looks like they have boots on. And, and so everybody wants to hold it. You know, you, you see a nice little caterpillar-like creature, you want to reach out and grab it? That would not be good with a velvet worm. I'll show you a picture of it. Let's see a picture of a velvet worm. I mean, how cute is that? The problem is this. He ain't cute. He's dangerous. In fact, the velvet worm is an ambush predator, and he's out at night where you can't see him. And a velvet worm who looks so cute and cuddly squirts from his head this ooey, gooey, sticky stuff onto his prey, and it quickly hardens. You can imagine how the prey's walking around thinking everything's cool, and suddenly they have this stuff, and they're like... And they're stuck. And then this cute, cuddly velvet worm walks up, all cute-like, sinks his teeth into the unsuspecting prey, and he injects this saliva, which is really specifically designed to liquefy the entire innards of this creature, so to make it easier to eat. I belabor the point because of this. I think Satan can make bad things look awful cute and awfully cuddly. Satan can do that. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. We get blinded and we don't understand what's really going on because there's someone at work. In their case, the God of this age, he's talking about Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is in the image of God. So we walk out into the night and if we're not using the mind of Christ, we're blinded, we're deceived, we can't see well. We enter the night and we don't see the velvet worm coming toward us. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14 Satan disguises himself, sometimes as an angel of light. I submit sometimes as a velvet worm. And you just don't know. If you don't use the mind of Christ, it's as though you're groping in the dark. It's like something out of the book of Isaiah. We won't turn there, but they're groping along a wall as if they are blind. A lot of Christians are doing that unnecessarily if we don't use the mind of Christ. So number two, if we don't use the mind of Christ, what are the consequences? Churches are filled, I believe, with people that are choosing not to use the mind of Christ, and they don't understand about the consequences. I want you to know them, that when you leave here today, you're going to be different. You didn't know that, did you? You didn't know when you were coming here this morning that you were going to leave here different. Well, I'm Native American, and I go out in the woods, used to go out a whole lot 
on vision quests. I'd be gone for weeks on end. And the goal was to be in touch with God. And people would say, that's the most dangerous place to go, Wayne. What about all those animals, the bears, the lions, the tigers? Oh, my. All of that, right? That's not dangerous. This. This is dangerous. When you came in here this morning to encounter the living God, that's dangerous. Because He shines the light of Christ on our lives. And if you let Him, He'll point out things. He'll speak and then you have to decide, am I going to listen or am I going to keep doing things the way I do? If we don't use the mind of Christ, what are the consequences? Ongoing immaturity. Ongoing immaturity. You know, it's great to be a kid. It's great to be a baby. I saw one coming in. It, it's great. I think I was one once. Right? It, it's great. But, but you grow up. That's the whole point. So, in our text, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. Brothers, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as babies in Christ. Can you hear his disappointment? I wanted this, but... I, you're not giving me that. I wanted to be able to speak to you in a certain way as a way that I would be able to speak to an adult, but you're still an infant, a baby. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, because you were not yet ready for it. In fact, after all these years, you're still not ready. A consequence of not using the mind of Christ is ongoing immaturity. Teachers in the New Testament period would often refer to their unskilled, those that were unskilled, those that were they were teaching, as infants. You're just an infant yet. You can't, you can't understand what I want to share. That's what Paul is saying. Guys, you have everything. And by this time, he had already been with them for a year and a half or more, teaching day after day, sharing of himself and of God day after day, and they still are babies? Really? They were choosing it. Teachers always expect their students to start with the basics, but to progress beyond them. That's the expectation of every teacher. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6 and following. Immature people acting immature. For among them are those who worm their way into households and capture idle women burdened down with sins, led along by a variety of passions, always learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, so these also resist the truth. Men who are corrupt, corrupt in mind, worthless in regard to the faith. Worthless. What a horrible statement of someone. But those who refuse to use the mind of Christ, that consequence is coming when you are worthless to the cause of the faith. Contrast that with 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20. Now in a large house, he's talking about the church here, people. In a large house, there are not only gold and silver bowls, but also those of wood and clay. Some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. So if anyone purifies himself from anything dishonorable, he will become a special instrument, set apart, useful to the master. Not worthless, useful to the master, prepared for every good 
work. God sets the path before us, the path that he intends for us to walk in. You find that in Ephesians 2. He set it before us, and he expects us to walk it. He's gifted us so that we can walk it, but he won't force us to walk it. Refuse the mind of Christ, and you have ongoing immaturity. But there's more. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11 and following. Again, we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews, but this is what he says. He's a teacher. He says, you know, we have a great deal to say about the faith, about this. And it's difficult to explain since you've become lazy, too lazy to understand. Although by this time, you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you the basic principles of God's revelation again. You need milk, not solid food. Now, everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced with the message about righteousness because he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, for those whose senses have been trained to distinguish between good and evil. Every single person sitting here this morning would like to be able to distinguish between good and evil 24-7. Amen? We want that. The people I counsel want that. And they always have the question, you know, Wayne, I don't know what to do. I don't know what's right, what's wrong. Well, of course you don't. But God wants to instruct us and to help us grow up so that we will know the difference. Another problem, another consequence for not using the mind of Christ is envy. Go back to our text, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 3 and 4. Envy. We're almost there. There we go. You are still fleshly, Paul says, of the church in Corinth. For since there is envy and strife among you, are you not fleshly and living like unbelievers? For whenever someone says, oh, I'm with Paul, and another, oh, I'm with Apollos, are you not unspiritual people? I want to tell you something that you can take to the bank this morning. And maybe you've never really looked at it quite this way before. Envy. Whether you're envious of what a person has, how a person looks, how a person acts, whatever. Envy, period, requires that you take your eyes off Jesus. You can't be envious if you're looking at Jesus. Let me show you what I mean. John chapter 21, verse 18 and following. You remember the story, it's, the, it's Peter being reinstated as an apostle after his dramatic fall, denying Jesus three times, all of that. Jesus invites him back in. They go for a walk and they're talking about his reinstatement. Lots of people look at that differently. We won't belabor that. But this is what Jesus says to Peter. He says, I assure you, when you were young, you would tie your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will tie you and carry you where you don't want to go. He said this to signify the kind of death he would glorify God by. After saying this, he said to Peter, follow me. So Peter turns around and saw the disciple Jesus loved following them. That disciple was the one who leaned back against Jesus at supper and asked, Lord, who is it, who is the one that's going to betray you? And when Peter saw him, he says to Jesus, Lord, what about him? about him? 
If I want him to remain until I come, Jesus answered, what is that to you? As for you, follow me. You can see this lived out, this picture. If that's Jesus and that's John and I'm Peter and I'm looking at Jesus and I'm talking to Jesus, the scripture says that Peter turns around and sees John following them. Can you see Jesus and Peter or and John at the same time? No. What about him, Jesus? Jesus is saying, what about him? That's between me and him. This is between you and me. Anyone that has a problem with envy has a problem not with envy, but a problem with keeping their eyes on Jesus. And if we keep our eyes on Jesus, envy goes away. The other thing the Scripture says is a consequence for not using the mind of Christ is strife. And we wonder why churches have strife. I mean, shouldn't church be, shouldn't church put Disney World out of business? Church should be the happiest place in the world. But churches aren't always that way. And that's why you have the First Baptist Church, the Second Baptist Church, the Third Baptist Church, the Fourth, and all the churches, they just get, they get upset about something and then they go somewhere else and they start something different. That's the way churches are, right? James chapter 4, verse 1 and following says, What is the source of of wars and fights among you, don't they come from the cravings that are at war within you? You desire and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war and you do not have because you do not ask. When we don't use the mind of Christ, that connection is impaired. And the consequence is strife because we begin to think that we deserve something that we're not giving when the ultimate supply of everything is Jesus Christ. Amen? Tom Selleck plays the character, TV character, um, Frank Reagan in the popular show Blue Bloods. Uh, I, I think, I think while well, younger people watch it, it's older guys like me that, that really like Tom Selleck and, uh, and Blue Bloods. He plays the New York City commissioner on the popular show Blue Bloods. And during one show, he made a very profound statement. He said, um, it's hard to do the right thing when you don't know what the right thing to do is. And that gave me pause. And I can see the world struggling with that. And yet you and I have no such excuse. None. What is right is written in the Word of God. And to understand it, we have been gifted the mind of Christ. Provided we use it. You ponder that.